Uh, one of the things I did when I started, uh, and this this gets to to one of the one of the main topics of useful wild plants is we need to know what we've got. We need to know where it is. We need to know what kind of shape it's in. So coming from a botanical background, one of the things that we did, among others, is to try to figure out what plants were growing where, what kind of shape they were in. Uh, and that was right at the beginning of kind of the, the real interest in Texas biodiversity kind of started with the interest in rare plants, I think, at least from 1970 on. And that, that's kind of the warm, cuddly, fuzzy thing that people get involved with and like. Today's August 8th, 2022. Uh, today, Queen Elizabeth passed. That's how we remember. My name is David Riskin. Uh, I am retired now, but for 48 years, I worked in Texas State Parks and essentially managed a science and stewardship program, which went under the uh, name of Natural Resources. Uh, we had prescribed fire, we had GIS, we had park planning. Uh, we had most of the stewardship services for state parks, one of the many divisions of Texas Parks Law Department, and I've been retired for three years. Before that, I worked uh, in school, graduate school, University of Texas, and when I met Scooter, uh, it was Brackenridge Field Lab, 1970 or maybe 1971. And I was working on a paleontological project, or paleoecological project, looking at uh, human diet as evidenced by coprolites uh, from uh, some prehistoric people. Uh, I can't remember the name of the site exactly, but it's in Valvary County. And uh, Scooter came in and was interested in what uh, early prehistoric peoples ate, and we talked about that. That's how, how we met. And actually, I was very interested in a useful wild plant project and committed to helping as much as I could. Little did I know it was going to take 48 or 49 or 50 years. Uh, but meanwhile, I have a 48-year career in parks and wildlife, and I've stayed in touch, but I don't know that I've been able to contribute as much as I would have liked or perhaps I contributed too much. Anyhow, uh, my topic is kind of an inside baseball peek into plant conservation in Texas. This is a little known story. Uh, I've already gone over one historical side note, but in the process of meeting with Scooter, I also worked with Vaughn Bryant, who used to be on the board. Vaughn is now deceased, uh, but he was a member in good standing of the Useful Wild Plant Board. Uh, The Natural Resource Program started in 1972, and up until a couple years ago, I was involved in that. But in the process, I was involved with Scooter, uh, Vaughn, Gaeta, as I said. As a matter of fact, I tried to hire Gaeta to be a botanist to work for East Texas Parks, and uh, she turned me down for good reason, because she is a free spirit and a free soul, or was and probably would not work well in the constrained environment of a, quite frankly, a bureaucracy. Um, I also worked with Marshall and originally with the Rare Plant Study Center, which was the earliest kind of organized effort to kind of document at least the rare plants as far as Texas biodiversity goes. Uh, one of the things I did when I started uh, and this, this gets to, to one, of the, one of the main topics of useful wild plants is we need to know what we've got. We need to know where it is. We need to know what kind of shape it's in. So coming from a botanical background, one of the things that we did, among others, is to try to figure out what plants were growing where, what kind of shape they were in. Uh, and that was right at the beginning of kind of the, the real interest in Texas biodiversity kind of started with the interest in rare plants, I think, at least from 1970 on. And that that's kind of the warm, cuddly, fuzzy thing that people get involved with and like. And so they sort of embraced it. But we did early on bi biological inventories for almost all the state parks. And in 1972, 
the park system uh, was just beginning to acquire most of the modern parks that we know about today. The McKinney Falls, the Pedernales Falls, uh, the Enchanted Rock, and so forth and so on. But at that time, uh, there was only one park that really had a biological inventory, and that was Palmetto State Park. And it was done, interestingly enough, by Corey. And they did that because they were real interested in acquiring Palmetto for its scientific value. It was the very first and only park that was really acquired for its scientific value. Of course, it, it had mud boils, it had bogs, it had a very, very interesting, very eastern or southeastern flora that caught the attention of people. It was a big deal. That was the only park that really had a botanical inventory. So we started doing detailed specimen-based botanical inventories. But I mean specimen-based, we collected plants, we made specimens of them, we put them in a herbarium and so forth and so on. So they could be documented as opposed to just a walkthrough where people said, I saw this, that, or the other, or looked in field guides and eyeball things, or said, oh, this must be within the range of the plant, we'll call it that. We did specimen-based inventories. Also important to know, the Endangered Species Act was signed into law in 1973. So that was the uh, uh, also something, it, it wasn't just plants, it was plants and animals, but it kind of underscored uh, the importance of national biodiversity. And of course, people were focusing on the rarities, but nonetheless, the Endangered Species Act began at that time to pick interest. Now, also at that time, there were absolutely no laws in Texas that related to plant, plant conservation, plant protection, and so forth. The Parks and Wildlife Department was a fish and game agency, and so they were interested in habitat, but there was no real authorization or no legislative enactment or mandate to focus specifically on plants. So the initial concern for, for rare plants, in, in, in my opinion, and, and from my perspective, because I, I was sitting there, not that people were not interested in plants before that, but it came up from a political standpoint because people started talking about all these vast piles of, of cacti that were being poached on private property. And there were newspaper stories showing the vast piles of collected plants. And there were stories showing little cacti in pots at O'Hare Airport in Chicago with little sombreros on them and little eyes. And Anyway, that got the attention of some politicians, and so they started looking around saying, you know, what's going on with this? Uh, and of course, Parks and Wildlife got a little bit interested from the game warden standpoint because they're the ones who enforce a lot of the laws, particularly as related to private land. And so the thinking was people are poaching these things on private land. And so we've got to figure out something to do with it. Uh, and so the game warden started asking us a little bit about, you know, what could we do? Uh, could we inform and educate the game wardens? Uh, how can you tell one plant versus the other? And again, the focus was on cacti. But anyway, that was an entree into the rare plants and to the fact, in my opinion, that Texas was losing some of its biodiversity through rustlers gain traction. You don't rustle in Texas. Um, so we started doing more detailed inventory and again there were collections in state parks because people collected herbarium specimens were collected in state parks but there was no real record of it. This is before databases. This is before scientific permits were issued. So there was a, there were a lot of collections in already in in, uh, in collections. Uh, so we started with that, and then we started doing some field work. But anyway, it's going back going back to native plant protection laws. Texas Parks and Wildlife had absolutely no authority to deal with plants, uh, even after the Endangered Species Act was was enacted. There was there was no real protection unless there was a federal nexus. In other words, it was on a federal piece of property or uh, if federal funds were involved. But that was the only plant conservation there was in Texas. And at that time, this is 1972, 73, uh, the only uh, Parks and Wildlife staff person who had a botanical background was, was me. 
And one of the basic elements that we started with, it was an outfit called the UT Rare Plant Study Center, which was started in 72 or maybe 73, and they worked on a provisional list. And that was the, the basis of, of, of uh, our concern about, about, now these were not endangered, they were not threatened, they were just rarities. Things that occurred in Texas, endemic species, or plants that were known only from one or two locations. We called them rarity. <laughs> also at that time, uh, the LBJ School Natural Areas Program was just getting started, and they were doing detailed inquiries. That was in U it, at UT, and it was under the authority of Don Kennard, who was also a good friend of Parks and Wildlife, and he was a good friend of conservationists. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, because of the Endangered Species Act and because of the work that Nature Conservancy had done, which I'm not sure whether Nature Serve was there at the time, but Nature Serve morphed out of the Nature Conservancy. They were interested in, in rare species also, and, and you know, they were charismatic species that they used to help buy and sell and conserve property. But the LB, LBJ School got started as well, uh, and they started doing detailed inventories flora, fauna, wildlife, archaeology, and so forth on state parks or on properties that the state park system may eventually include or the national park system may, may include. But the point of it is they, they kind of amped up the concern about Texas's natural diversity. And Kennard being a former representative, he had political connections. He was locked into parks and wildlife. He was locked into the general land office, which was Bob Armstrong at the time, also another friend of conservation. Uh, and following him was Gary Morrow, who also had a conservation mindset and at least was concerned about the diversity of, uh, of Texas. And both of those two in the land office started inventorying the vast uh, general land office holdings, in, in, particularly in West Texas. So uh, we worked cooperatively on assessing some of those. Interestingly enough, one of the early assessments uh, that I did with the GLO was big, what was to become Big Bend Range, which of course had quite a few uh, endemic species and uh, native uh, of limited distribution and so forth. But starting in about the mid-70s, I remember having a conservation with Ned Fritz. And uh, if you know Ned Fritz uh, or know of him, you knew that he was an outspoken and highly effective environmental advocate in the Texas environmental community. He started, among other things, T. Connor, Texas Committee on Natural Resources. But one of the things that, that, that Ned had a burr in his saddle, so to speak, he didn't like prescribed burning. He was adamant against prescribed burning. And the reason for that is, is the Forest Service did a lot of prescribed burning in East Texas. And as far as Ned uh, was aware, it essentially was straight for timber management and was adverse to biodiversity and preservation of wetlands and rare plants and so forth. But anyway, I needed to talk to Ned because he was one of the leading spokesmen um, of the environmental community. And as I said, he was adamantly against prescribed burning. Just about that time, doing our inventories in state parks, we realized that prescribed burning, this was in 72 or 73, 74 in there, we realized that prescribed burning was a really important tool and to apply it on landscape scale was one of the only effective ways you could do management of a lot of habitats and a lot of communities uh, in the state. So essentially I went to Ned and had a number of uh, interesting conversations but I, I knew that if I couldn't get his support, then there was no way I could get support internally at Parks and Wildlife to do prescribed burning. Now remember, this is early 70s, and prescribed burning as a stewardship a tool was not commonly used anywhere. So we wanted to embark on that in a few key places where we knew it would be uh, effective. But anyway, going back and forth with Ned, I, m I made the comment, uh, Ned, <laughs> I said, if you really want to do something positive for Texas conservation, direct some of your boundless energies to advocating some plant protection legislation. Texas has none. And Ned had boundless energy. I said, Parks and Wildlife has no authority, and Texas has great diversity, which needs protection. Uh, and of course, Ned was well aware of this from his efforts in the original Natural Area Survey, 
uh, they focused on rare communities and some of which had, of course, very limited rare plants. Um, anyway, Ned finally looked at me and he said, you've got a point. You got a point. I understand. I'll see what I can do. Uh, shortly thereafter, Ned reported he had found someone who would draft the proposed legislation based on what few other states had done and from materials I had supplied from my research. What we did is we looked at all the states that had plant protection legislation or ordinances or what have you that addressed the issue in the context of, of, a, of a state uh, legal and legislative authority. Well, in short order, Ned recruited a young fellow by the name of Jack Noakes, an attorney, a new attorney, whom, as I recall, was working with the Texas Community Foundation here in town. I may not be quite accurate on that, but he was working with some NGO here in Austin. Anyway, and Ned was tasked to come up with a draft. So he came up with a draft based on all the material that, that, that uh, he had analyzed from, from what I gave him, plus some additional stuff. We got, came with some draft language and massaged it. And of course, as you know, you're working through drafts and so forth and so on. But Ned was able to get a very new representative from Houston, District 79, by the name of Rep Representative Deborah Danberg, to carry the proposed bill. She's not, she's practicing in, in, in town here, but she's not in the legislature anymore. But she was uh, one of the, one of the, early women in the legislature and she had some some stature and I think quite honestly the good old boys paid some attention to her uh, good old persons I'm sorry anyway it was district 79 uh, and I provided staff support to the proposed legislation as it went its way through the legislative process I don't want to get into that but uh, you have to you have to get legislation. You have to find some sponsor. They go through their legal channels. They see if they can get it on committee. They go back to the agency that where the potential home to see whether they would support it or not or accept it. And anyway, it goes through the process. Anyway, uh, the draft legislation finally went its way through the legislative process. There were hearings. There were committee hearings. They went through the agriculture department, so forth and so on. But remember I said early on that the game wardens were kind of interested in some kind of plant protection because here they were, people were poaching on private property and they didn't have any any venue to, to deal with it. So there was some legis there was some support in Parks and Wildlife amongst the law enforcement staff. Again, because it was a political issue and it had some resonance when stories showed up in newspapers about plant poaching and so forth. And it also got the attention of private landowners because almost all this stuff was coming off of private land. Uh, amazingly, the legislation was approved and signed into law. It became Subtitle G, Plants, Chapter 88, Endangered Plants, Parks and Wildlife Code, effective September 1, 1981. So at that point, Parks and Wildlife had some authority over plants and plant conservation. And shortly after that, uh, Jackie Poole and I produced a manual on how to recognize endangered plants for law enforcement. And I saw one on your shelf today. That was the first informational and educational piece that came out. But its primary design was to help law enforcement recognize rare plants so that they could enforce the rare plant laws. Anyway, fast forward a little bit. Uh, Jackie Poole became the first official agency botanist after the Heritage Program at the GLO transferred to Parks and Wildlife. The, the Heritage Program, which was sponsored by the Nature Conservancy, uh, was not housed at Parks and Wildlife originally. It was picked up in the General Land Office. And I, I think it was originally picked up uh, when Armstrong was there, but uh, it was there primarily when uh, Gary Morrow uh, was the uh, agency head for uh, GLO. In any event, having legislative authority to wreck toward plant Rare plants gave Parks and Wildlife new tools for habitat protection and conservation education. Importantly, plant conservation was now an integral part of the agency's mission. The stars were aligned such that even in conservative Texas, an important conservation tool was enacted into law. Fast forward a little bit. 
The Wildlife Diversity Program in the Wildlife Division now has a botanist and a plant ecologist dedicated to plant and habitat conservation, stewardship, and education. Uh, and with uh, Parks and Wildlife Co-Legislative Authority, the agency also has access to matching and uh, funds, cost-sharing, federal grants, and so forth, when a lot of that support plant conservation in Texas. And one early authoritative outcome of this, of course, was a book by uh, Jackie Poole, Bill Carr, um, Dana Price, and Jason Singhurst in 2007, Rare Plants of Texas and m Press. Um, and that is the Bible of uh, basically plant diversity, uh, particularly with regard to rare and endangered or unusual plants in Texas. And with deference to W.F. Strong, some of these plants are useful. I mentioned earlier that uh, we started doing detailed botanical inventories of state parks to find out what kind of diversity we had and also all to focus conservation efforts and stewardship efforts and to do whatever resource protection we needed. But uh, we relied on a lot of collaborators all over the state to do that. Uh, at that time also uh, my particular program <laughs> Didn't have, didn't have very much funding, and so we relied on cooperators and colleagues in the botanical community to help us do our inventory. We kind of structured it a little bit. We told them what we wanted and where we wanted. Uh, and interestingly enough, the very first state park that had a complete, I use the word complete, by concerted day in and day out over a one or two year period was Lost Maple State Park, which was acquired. And, um, I got Jackie Poole to do an inventory there and also to establish some uh, baseline uh, transects and quadrants, and so we use those to this very day. Uh, fast forward a little bit, we did the same thing at Bastrop, and we had very good detailed information, and of course in 2011 that devastating fire came through. So with all the inventory we had, plus the follow-up inventories that Bill Carr did, plus staff, I mean I did some, but we actually got someone like Bill to follow up on a daily basis over uh, several seasons. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what was there and how it recovered and how the, the uh, flora and uh, the rare species responded to, to fire, which were pretty surprising, actually. And we have that in an organized, retrievable, uh, qualitative and quantitative format. But in any event, I digress. Some of the people who collaborated with us over time to do our botanical inventories, again, they did the they did the observations, but they also did the field collections. And so almost all the unusual stuff is going to be backed up by specimens. Uh, most of them are at UT, but they're duplicates in a number of other institutions, depending on what part of the state the park was in. For example, in East Texas, some of them were uh, in L. Ray Nixon's institution. Uh, in West Texas, a lot of them were at Richard Worthington's uh, herbarium or Mike Powell, the Powell Herbarium at Sol Ross. And so we had duplicate copies at, at UT with regional herbarium also getting duplicate copies. But here's some of the names, you might recognize them. Larry Brown, unfortunately deceased. Joe Liggio, who's still working on uh, rare plants. Bill Mahler at, at uh, which is now Brett, it used to be the SMU Herbarium. Marshall Johnson, now retired. Richard D. Worthington at UTEP, now retired. Richard uh, spent a lot of time at Waco Tanks, Franklin Mountains, uh, and Big Bend Ranch. He did some detailed inventories. I did too, but I mean, that's all he did. I was doing other stuff as well, including planning and uh, working in the system. Uh, I mentioned Jackie Poole already. Tony Keeney, deceased, uh, he did a lot of work with us at Kickapoo Canyon and uh, he helped us a lot with uh, rare things like Ancestor Cactus to uh, and he documented some of the parks in that part of the state, which is around Uvalde. Chester Rowell, of course, at Angelo State, uh, Bill Carr, still doing work, still contributing, Matt White, Roger Sanders, uh, who was associated with uh, Brett at the time, Guy Neeson, Eric Keith, who's an independent contractor uh, who does a lot of work in East Texas, uh, Emily Jane Lott, 
Uh, Jim Hendrickson worked with me in Chinatis and some of the parks out west and some of the adjacent property in Mexico, which we don't have, but it's helpful to know what's nearby to help you understand what you've got, what you might look for. Al Richardson, of course, Walter Holmes at Baylor, Burford Westland helped with a lot of cacti and any of the parks that had cacti. He could see them where no one else could. A. Michael Powell, a Roy Morey, and of course, plus the staff that was uh, was there the full time, myself, Jackie Poole, Bill Carr, Jason Singhurst, and, and a few others. But they're the people who help day in and day out uh, and uh, help document the diversity of, uh, of the state parks. And again, these are observations, but they're also backed up with specimens as appropriate in various herbaria uh, of the state. But I used Emily later on, if you'll recall, I got her back to do a more detailed inventory of uh, Chinati Mountains because she had worked on Chinati Mountains when the Natural Area Survey had done work out there. Uh, a part of it, not the part that we acquired for a state natural area, but they had done work on the part that Bobby French had as part of his ranch when they went to look at Chinati Mountains as part of the Natural Area Survey. So Emily agreed to follow up with that. Of course, I supported it. make sentient people more aware of what's around them and what they need to survive and what they need to coexist with and what makes the planet a complete and livable place. And so I think to the extent uh, people have knowledge, they have appreciation, and, uh, and theoretically they will have a, a, a more acute and immediate sense for protecting and conserving those resources. And I think having an encyclopedia, truly an encyclopedia, such as Useful Wild Plants, Volume 1 through 4 and more to come, uh, helps people get that information in a condensed form. And it, they relate to it because it's not just pure botany. It's, it's ethnobotany, it's archaeology, it's history, it's uh, primitive man's use of uh, our heritage. Uh, um, it, it speaks to adaptation and uh, resourcefulness, and I think all of that makes us better and more complete people, humans.